It's the last week of April, and we're happy to have you watching CNN 10. I'm Carl Azus. Hope you had a great weekend. First subject of the week, the State of the Union Address. Or is it the annual message? Or is it a speech to a joint session of Congress? Some of the above? This week, U.S. President Joe Biden is scheduled to speak before the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives, hence a joint session of Congress. Article 2, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution states that the president shall do this, quote, from time to time. It doesn't say it has to be done on TV. It doesn't say it has to be done in person. It doesn't say when the information has to be given. Tradition plays a dominant role in the president's annual message. Everything we're used to seeing, even when we're used to seeing it. The previous six presidents gave their first speeches to the entire Congress in February, but that's been a recent tradition, not a constitutional requirement. In fact, it's tradition that a president's first speech to the entire Congress isn't called a State of the Union address. The idea behind that is that the newly inaugurated leader hasn't been in office long enough to be an authority on the State of the Union. CNN 10 contributor Rachel Janfaza explores what exactly is happening Wednesday night. President Biden will soon deliver his first address to a joint session of Congress. But Carl, it technically won't be his first State of the Union address, which is what the president's annual message to a joint session of Congress, the justices of the Supreme Court, the president's cabinet, and other special guests is usually called. Traditionally, a president is in office for a year before they give their first State of the Union address. But presidents are usually invited to speak before a joint session of Congress during their first few months in office. This speech, before both the House of Representatives and the Senate chambers, can be referred to as an annual message or a message on a particular topic, such as an economic message. The tradition is rooted in the Constitution. The Constitution states that the President shall from time to time give the Congress information of the State of the Union and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. While the concept of a yearly check-in is the same, the linguistics are different and the guest list may be smaller, especially this year, given the COVID-19 pandemic. The history of a presidential address to Congress dates back to President George Washington, who was the first to deliver a regular address before a joint session in New York in 1790. The message used to be known as the President's Annual Message to Congress, until 1934, when President Franklin D. Roosevelt referred to it as the annual message to Congress on the State of the Union. From 1942 to 1946, it began to be informally called the State of the Union Message or Address, and since 1947, it has officially been known as the State of the Union Address. During a State of the Union, the President reflects on the past year, how the country's doing, and uses the opportunity to highlight their administration's legislative agenda, which needs congressional support. In modern history, presidents have used their first address to a joint session to outline their goals and lay out hopes for their administration. So Carl, while a presidential address to a joint session of Congress during their first year in office may not have all the formal fanfare of a State of the Union, it can be used to highlight the president's agenda and set a forward-thinking tone. 10-second trivia. Which of these buildings is considered to be the world's first skyscraper? Flatiron Building, Home Insurance Building, Empire State Building, or Kavanaugh Building? The 10-story tall Home Insurance Building was the world's first skyscraper when it was completed in 1885. 10 stories, as in 138 feet, as in about four school buses high. If you're thinking, ooh, more like a tree scraper, keep in mind that this was only about 30 years after Elijah Graves Otis invented his elevator safety system that made elevators more secure. That made people feel safer on them, and that led to the soaring skyscrapers that stretch city skylines. The sky has long been a fascination, a realm of the gods and civilizations have been building toward it for centuries. But a skyscraper is an altogether modern idea made possible by modern technologies. Skyscrapers are really an American invention. The first use of the word was around the 1880s. They were office buildings that concentrated a workforce. They employ technologies like the elevator, like steel construction to build very efficiently and to pile a lot of space onto a small piece of land. 
By using steel frames for structural support rather than heavy masonry walls, architects were able to get creative. Skyscrapers began to get taller around the turn of the 20th century. There was competition to be the world's highest. And that pinnacle tower becomes so intimately connected with modernity. The skyscraper hitching post for the great airliners of tomorrow. The Empire State Building never actually moored limps, but it gave that aspiration. After World War II, a new kind of technology of glass allows for the curtain wall. Windows you could open made way for giant glass walls. They gave more floor space and natural light, but fresh air was shut out and replaced with air conditioning. In the 1960s and 70s, that was the period of the World Trade Center with the Twin Towers. The Sears Tower in Chicago got a little bit taller. But it was also the end of an era as American cities began to suburbanize and spread out. The US had led the charge into the skies, but the rest of the world soon caught up. In Hong Kong, where the land is very scarce, going high is almost the only solution. There's that need in terms of urbanization, so people need to move to the cities, they need to work, to live. In Asia and the Middle East, we took it to another level. Every city wants to have this landmark that gives that a sense of distinct culture. From the end of the 20th century, architects in the East have been developing new techniques to beat the wind and climb even higher. You want to design a shape that is not square. You want rounded corners or faceted corners so that it takes pressure off the building when the wind hits it. You design the building to sway a little bit. We use reinforced concrete to have that flexibility that also absorbs movement. The Taipei 101 used a step design, cut out corners and a 700 ton suspended dampener to help it withstand typhoons and earthquakes. But it was Dubai's Burj Khalifa that redefined SuperTool. Its exaggerated tapered shape, ability to flex up to six feet at its top and a double layered outer skin help it to counter desert storms and extreme heat. To build the world's tallest tower is a great demonstration of technological know-how as well as wealth, of course. But the vanguard of architects has been very focused on sustainability. We want to design something that's as sustainable as possible in terms of the spaces, the use of materials. Tall buildings is sustainable where we can have a lot of people in a small footprint, but we all understand that building in itself is taking resources from the earth. In cities like Hong Kong, where skyscrapers dominate the environment, but also contribute significantly to greenhouse gas emissions, the centuries-old reach into the sky is now in question. Skyscrapers become complicated negotiations between the way that we want to live in the future and the possibilities of how we can. There are many different approaches of culture, of government, of public policy that either constrains or enables skyscrapers. For 10 out of 10, a recent light show in Shanghai, China goes 3D. How did technicians do this? With drones, hundreds of them. They were synced up to form the image of a smartphone, and then video game characters appeared to leap off the screen. The whole thing was intended to promote a popular mobile game, but when the drones formed a giant QR code that linked to the game's website, well, for fans, it was game on. For critics... It's game over. They Q are concerned about the proliferation of promotion. But if Q are the type to find air shows illuminating, and you don't mind scanning and training your phone and your eyes on the planning pertaining to drones in the skies, this could be the kind of thing you drone on about long after the lights come down. I'm Carl Azus for CNN 10. Pendleton High School is in Pendleton, Oregon, and you get today's shout out for subscribing and commenting on our YouTube channel.